Okay, welcome. Good morning, everybody. I'm so happy that you decided to join me for how to control your sugar and carb cravings without feeling deprived. I'm super excited about presenting this information to you today. For those of you who don't already know me, I know most of you that are on joining me live do, but um, a lot of people will be receiving the recording and not they aren't all familiar with me. So my name is Luz Chacon. I'm a wellness coach. I've been working in the health promotion field for over 30 years. And in 2014, I founded my own private practice, Salud y Alegría Wellness. And through that practice, I offer individual and group coaching programs. I also offer individual and group EFT or tapping sessions. EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Techniques. I know that some of you are familiar with it and some of you may not be. So for those who aren't, I will be saying a little bit more about exactly what that modality is toward the end of the webinar. So I'm actually going to, um, let's see, I want to get my face off the screen so I'm not distracted. Okay. All right, so I want to be able to focus and for everybody to focus on the uh, slides rather than my face, but I did want to just pop in to say <laughs> hi uh, at the beginning, and I will um, bring the video back up at the end when we have questions. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in to our topic for today. So I shared a little bit about who I am, but I also want to talk, talk a little bit about my story because this is why I'm so passionate about supporting people to, to break up with sugar. Um, as a little girl, I was a super picky eater, and I think I was a picky eater because I what you see on the screen <laughs> tended to be my staple foods. Um, I mean, of course I ate real food as well, but I was, on a steady diet of the types of foods you see on the screen, as well as Nestle's Quick and other sweets. So I ended up with uh, a mouthful of cavities, with acne, and then of course I ended up taking antibiotics for, for that as well, for gum disease actually. And so that ended up resulting in a condition that's called yeast overgrowth or, or candida. Of course, I didn't know that until much later. And I'm sure the antibiotics that I took for my acne and the, and the gum disease played a role in that as well, um, as well as the sugar, because antibiotics kill off both good and bad bacteria. As an adult, of course, I cleaned up my diet. I wasn't necessarily eating all of these foods all the time, but I was eating what I would, a lot of what I would call convenience foods. Um, well, back then I would have called them convenience foods. Now I would call them processed food-like substances, because a lot of, especially like what you see on the screen, is, is really not food in my opinion. It's not real food. As I was approaching uh, 50, so like in my late 40s, I started developing more and more symptoms, everything that you see there on the screen. So my blood sugar was very unstable. I was tired all the time. I'd get brain fog, mood swings, I was starting to have certain digestive issues, heartburn pretty regularly, rashes, etc. So in 2012 is when I enrolled in the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. They have a health coach training program that really appealed to me. And at that point, my positions had become mostly managerial and I really wanted to go back to my original passion of doing more health education, working more directly with people and to be able to support them to eat healthier. So enrolling in this program actually transformed my own health when I heard a lecture on yeast overgrowth, and I recognized that that was the root cause of all of these symptoms that I thought were kind of random symptoms, but in truth, they were all being caused by an overgrowth of yeast. And being somebody who likes to practice what I preach, I recognize that I wouldn't, couldn't coach others unless I cleaned up my own diet first. So on January 1st, 2013, it was my New Year's resolution, and I broke up with sugar. And I've been eating a mostly sugar-free, yeast-free, and refined carb-free diet ever since. 
needless to say, all the, all the symptoms that I was experiencing disappeared. I also lost 15 pounds. So again, I'm passionate about helping others uh, kick sugar to the curb because it's, sugar is so damaging to our health. And, and that's what we're going to see um, through this uh, webinar. So I do want to take a moment for each of you to introduce yourselves. If you could just say your name. So if you could take uh, your device off of mute for just a moment and introduce yourself, just say your name and what you crave most. In other words, do you mostly crave sweets, carbs, or salty snacks, or maybe it's all of them? So who would like to go first? I will. Torment. I crave all of them, but the bigger Oops. issue is not the food itself, but the time of day when they become my go-to, which is always the evening. Got it. Okay, that was Karen, right? Yes, and yes. we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that because those late night cravings are, are, are very common, and I'll share a little bit more about the reasons for that. Carmen, I think you were uh, trying to chime in. Um, donuts have always been like a red light food for me, and as well as I would say, and brownies as far as sweets, but I'm, I'm not into cookies or ice cream, but what I do like are, I, I would say, bread, like bagels, pizza, things like that. Okay, thank you. Who'd like to go next? Eve, this is Eve, and um, I crave all of it, but my biggest craving is the, the carbs, the, the bagels, the bread, and um, around three o'clock every afternoon is, is when my cravings really become strong. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, Irene, are you still with us? Maybe she... Hi there, sorry oh, about that. But that's okay. <laughs> um, I would have to say the carbs, the bread, things like that. Okay. Salty. <laughs> and salty, okay. Okay, yeah. so, so I, I thank you. And mid-afternoon is pretty much, or if I stay up late, it's like, okay, now I want salty, now I want bread, that type of stuff. Right. Okay. Yeah, and this is such a common thing. Um, I hear this all the time, and um, I hope that, you know, you can see that you're, you're not alone in this situation, and it's my hope to be able to help you with this. In fact, let's talk about our intentions for today. So, my hope is that you have that you gain a better understanding of how sugar affects your body, your brain, your hormones, and your mood. And I'm going to be sharing information on five root causes of sugar and carb cravings, as well as the five strategies to be able to control them without feeling deprived. And before we dive into the topic, I do want to get on the same that, that we get on the same page about carbs because that's a a term that's tossed around a lot and used kind of lightly. And I'm gonna actually use it in that same way throughout the webinar, but I do want to make sure that we all are clear on the fact that there's lots of different types of carbs. So complex carbs are the healthy ones because they have lots of fiber, lots of uh, phytonutrients or micronutrients like vitamins and minerals. And so that includes everything you see in the first picture, fruits, vegetables, and nuts, seeds, as well as whole grains. And then, of course, simple or refined carbs are foods that are made from grains, but they've been uh, processed to where the fiber has been removed, and some of the nutrients, or a lot of the nutrients actually have been removed. Of course, food manufacturers will add some nutrients back in. Um, you know, in other words, they enrich them, but they do still act very much like sugar in the body in terms of way of how they're metabolized or, or processed. Um, and then lastly, we have things that are pretty much empty calories. So the things you see in the last picture, you know, soda and donuts, candy, cookies, etc., because they pretty much are sugar and often fat and uh, not much in the way of nutrition at all. I also want to put 
this struggle in context by comparing our modern food environment with how human beings evolved. Prior to the time that humans started to grow food through agriculture, uh, they had to hunt and gather their food, which means that for the majority of human existence, food was actually scarce. There was either feast or famine. So our ancestors evolved to store excess calories as fat for lean times. So our brains are still wired in the same way. In other words, they're wired to respond to calorie dense food as a protective me mechanism so that we don't starve. Even though currently we're surrounded by highly processed convenience foods 24 uh, seven. In other words, we don't have that issue of, of starvation, of the possible starvation, but this instinct is still remains intact. So, so that means that there's a mismatch between our brains that crave uh, foods that are, give us quick energy and the current food environment. Um, I'm, I'm hearing some background noise, so if, if you could uh, put your device on mute again, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure where that's coming from, but if you could double check and make sure that you're on mute. So this is where we are now. Our current food environment is filled with sweets, processed foods, and simple carbs. Refined sugar, in fact, didn't even exist in our diets until about a thousand years ago. And when it did enter our food supply, it wasn't a very common ingredient. It, in, uh, it, in fact, the, uh, the use of it has skyrocketed in the last 300 years. About 300 years ago, people ate about five pounds of sugar per year, whereas now we're eating about 150, which is a 3,000% increase. And as far as grains go, until the 1880s, wheat and other grains were stone ground, which kept most of the nutrients and fiber intact. Whereas now, grains are industrially processed, which refines them to the point that they act just like sugar in our bodies. And then when you add into that equation, the fact that we live such busy, hectic lives, this results in us relying on prepared, packaged, processed foods or eating out at restaurants. And all of those options tend to be higher in calories and sugar and salt and unhealthy fats, as well as many different types of chemical additives like dyes, preservatives, artificial flavorings, as well as pesticides. There's many reasons why our, our modern food environment is so full of processed foods, but that could be a whole other webinar in, its, in and of itself. So I'm, I only want to highlight one other important factor that speaks to why sugar consumption has increased so drastically. In the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of research being done to identify the dietary factors um, for heart disease. And, and um, the research that was being done was identifying sugar as one of the major risk factors, but the uh, sugar industry didn't want that information to get out and affect their profits. So they actually bribed the scientists who were doing the research to skew the data towards saturated fats and cholesterol. And so this resulted in, in the Harvard scientists downplaying sugar's role, and this led to a focus on reducing dietary fats. Of course, when you make fat, um, low fat foods, more sugar is added because low fat food or non fat food doesn't taste that good. So they need to add more sugar to make it tasty. Dr. Mark Hyman is um, a physician that I follow and who I highly respect and one of uh, the people I've, I most admire in the wellness community. And um, he says that despite 40 years of Americans being brainwashed into thinking that fat is bad, it turns out it's sugar, not fat, that makes you sick and overweight. Of course, that doesn't mean that all fats are healthy. What it means is that cholesterol and saturated fats are not as risky as we used to believe. And sugar is really the culprit. And the article that you see there, I believe came out in 2016, and there have been several articles that have uh, revealed this, um, what happened in the 50s and 60s uh, where 
sugar, the sugar industry shifted the blame to fat. In fact, there's even books written about it. So we're surrounded by processed foods that are full of sugar. We're too busy to cook. We're stressed out by our hectic lives, which makes us end up turning to comfort foods out of both convenience as well as to self-soothe sometimes. And these and other factors have contributed to the obesity epidemic that we have in our country where 36% of the adults are either overweight or obese. And sugar isn't just bad for our waistlines. It's linked with all of the health conditions that you see on this slide. When it comes to sugar, we often hear about the risk for diabetes. But as you can see, there's much more, including heart disease, like I've already uh, touched upon. And it does, doesn't just affect our physical health, health um, but our mental health as well, since it's linked with depression and anxiety. It's even bad for our skin because sugar causes oxidative stress on our organs. And not only does that affect our internal organs, but our skin is also an organ, so it tends to um, contribute to premature aging. And I've, I've highlighted three conditions there, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because these are the ones where the evidence, evidence is the strongest, meaning that sugar, um, you know, it's very clear that sugar increases the risk of those three conditions. And I do want to say a bit more, I want to highlight non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because that's a condition that is very much on the rise. In fact, 31% of adults and 13% of kids in the U.S. have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it can progress to something called NASH, which stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease basically means that there's a buildup of fat in the liver. And with NASH, there's also, it progresses to inflammation and scarring similar to cirrhosis of the liver. But rather than that being from drinking alcohol, it's caused by excess sugar consumption. In fact, NASH has become the third leading cause of liver transplants in this country. And a Possible signs that somebody has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is excess belly fat, especially if your waist circumference is larger than your hips. Uh, when we eat too much sugar, the liver converts excess to triglycerides, which is a type of fat. Some of that fat is stored in the liver and some is stored elsewhere in the body, especially in the belly area near internal organs. And this is really concerning um, because visceral fat, fat that's near the organs, increases the risk of heart disease and diabetes, but also of stroke, of cancer, and of Alzheimer's disease. So I want to take a closer look at how our bodies metabolize sugar and how eating too much can make us sick. Most types of sugar, like like Sucrose, which is table sugar, is made up of a glucose and a fructose molecule. When we eat foods with sugar, the glucose and the fructose molecule come apart and are metabolized differently. Glucose enters the cells for energy, but it needs insulin to escort it in. It's kind of like a key, uh, key that opens up the lock. And we're going to talk about that more when we get to the diff the, um, the causes of cravings. But for now, I want to emphasize that with high sugar or refined carb intake, over time, our cells start to become insulin resistant, which makes it more difficult for the glucose to get into our cells for energy, which can eventually lead to diabetes. But let's take a closer look at fructose because it's processed very differently. It has to be metabolized by the liver, which converts it to glucose. But when there's an excess of fructose, the liver converts it to fat which contributes to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And as we already learned, that can trigger inflammation. And um, we saw how serious that condition can be. So you may be wondering, what about fruit um, or the fructose in fruit? For the most part, that's not an issue because fruit comes packaged with lots of water, with uh, fiber, with phyto phytonutrients that are very beneficial for our health, like antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals. 
And the fiber protects the liver from too high a dose. In other words, naturally occurring sugar in fruit is not the problem. The problem is refined sugar. Um, food manufacturers extract fructose from sugar cane, corn, or beets to, and remove the fiber and nutrients in the process. So in its natural form, our bodies can handle the fructose from fruit, um, of course, in moderation and balance, because for some people, eating too much can be an issue, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But refined or processed sugar is what our bodies were not designed to handle. Okay, so now let's dive in to talking about the five root causes of sugar and carb cravings, as well as the strategies to overcome them. Number one is the fact that sugar is addictive. This is what makes sweets and carbs so hard to resist. When, once we have some, we want more. And um, that eating a lot of it can lead to a number of different biochemical imbi imbalances, including the um, the imbalances in our gut microbiome, which we're going to talk about, imbalances in our blood sugar, hormonal imbalances, and we're also going to talk about the underlying emotional factors that can contribute to cravings. Some animal studies have shown that sugar is actually eight times more addictive than cocaine, and that's because it triggers the exact same area of the brain, meaning the pleasure center that is stimulated by drugs. So when this pleasure center is stimulated, we release dopamine, which is a hormone that makes us feel good, actually dopamine and serotonin. So of course, once we have some, we feel good, and that makes us want another hit, so to speak, just like with drugs. And like with any addiction, we can start to develop tolerance, meaning that we need more of it to get the same feeling of reward no longer eating it can result in withdrawal syndromes, sy symptoms rather. Um, in fact, I definitely experienced that the first two to three days after breaking up with sugar. However, once I got past that initial time period where I was getting headaches and brain fog and I felt low energy, then it felt like a cloud was lifted and I began to be feel better than I had in years. What makes this addiction so challenging is that even if we're avoiding sweets, we can still be eating way too much sugar because, because it's ubiquitous in processed foods. In fact, sugar's added to about 75% of the packaged food in, in, that you'll find in the grocery store, even to foods that we often think of as healthy, like yogurt, granola, energy bars, but also to savory foods like ketchup, dressing, and sauces. So it's, it's very difficult to avoid. The American Heart Association recommends that we limit our consumption of sugar to what you see here, six teaspoons for uh, women, nine teaspoons for men, and three to eight for children. Yet the average person consumes 22 per day, and the average child, 32. This slide shows exactly how easy it is to exceed those recommended limits, even when a person is not indulging in sweets. In fact, what's on this slide somewhat reflects what I used to eat, not that I ate this on a daily basis, but, but I did tend to eat low-fat yogurt with fruit and granola uh, for breakfast on weekdays, and that has 50 grams of sugar. I tended to have salads, prepackaged salads, like from Trader Joe's, of thinking, you know, that's healthy, right? But it had, they had eight grams of sugar. Pasta with tomato sauce has 30 grams. And so guess what? I was at that average of 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. And that's not even including eating any dessert, let alone when somebody eats let, or drinks sweetened beverages, which is the greatest source of sugar for the majority of people in this country. And I often people... Um, the people that I coach will say, I just need to have more willpower. But to that, I reply that willpower is not enough. Since food companies intentionally engineer food to be addictive, they actually hire scientists to develop processed foods with just the right amount of sugar, salt, and fat. 
to make them so titillating to your taste buds that it keeps you coming back for more. They even have a name for it for this. They call it the bliss point and they refer to people who buy their products as heavy users. And this was exposed in a book written by an investigative journalist, Michael Moss, called Salt, Sugar, and Fat. And then another investigative journalist, Mark Schatzker, wrote The Dorito Effect, where he added to the equation that it isn't just salt, sugar, and fat, but the scientists also concoct these natural flavorings, natural or artificial flavorings. In truth, both are artificial because for it to be called natural, it only has to have one ingredient that's natural and the rest can be all artificial. And many of these flavorings are proprietary formulas that have all sorts of chemicals and they don't have to reveal what's in those formulas. And so the combination of these things, salt, sugar, fat, and flavorings, make these processed foods hyper palatable and ultra addictive. So it's no wonder that it's hard to resist our cravings. Um, we're literally being manipulated by the food industry. So what's the solution? Eat real food. The more we eat sugar and processed foods, the more addicted we become. Once you move away from the, these foods, it resets your taste buds and you start to appreciate the subtle flavors of real food. But I know that's easier said than done, so I will discuss some other strategies as we go along. The other piece to the eating real food is that we have to be able to identify the hidden sugars in processed foods. And um, food manufacturers make this a little bit tricky because they add many different types of sugar to products. So this complicates the situation because what we're concerned about is refined sugar, not naturally occurring sugars that come from fruit or dairy products. And there's newer labels that separate the added sugars from the total sugars, sugars in a product that allow you to identify the difference, but not all products or manufacturers have shifted to these new labels yet. So you're still gonna see the old label that just has total sugars. And so when you see that, like on this product here, it has 16 grams of sugar, but we don't know how many of those are added from refined sugars and how many are naturally occurring. So we need to go beyond the nutrition facts to look at the list of ingredients and identify what sugars are in this product. And so you can see here, I actually used this picture for another webinar also. So what's underlined isn't just sugar. There's also some, some unhealthy fats that are underlined. But this particular product has five different types of sugar. So they break it up. They, they use different types, um, making it more difficult for us to identify, especially because there's so many different types. In fact, this slide shows the 73 different names for sugar that may be listed on, on labels, on the ingredients list. And so, in fact, you may want to take a moment to take a picture of this slide so you have this as a reference. It's a good idea to be able to have this list at, at, um, at your fingertips on your phone, for example, so that when you go to the grocery store, and you're trying to buy products that are, uh, don't have sugar that you know what to look for because a lot of them end in OSE, like dextrose and um, arabinose, but then there's lots of others, or fructose, of course, glucose, but there's others that you might not recognize as being sugar. And so it's a good idea, like I said, to familiarize yourself with the 73 different names so that when you go shopping, you can be a label detective and spot the hidden sugars in these products. Root cause number two is an imbalance in the gut microbiome. We have a whole ecosystem of microbes in our stomach and intestines, including bacteria, viruses, yeast, etc. And these organisms as well as their DNA, are actually crucial for our health. You may be familiar with what Hippocrates said, um, all disease begins in the gut, and he was very correct in saying that. When there's 
an imbalance, which is also called gut dysbiosis. It can cause inflammation. And we now know that inflammation is the underlying cause of most diseases. When we have an imbalance of certain microbes, especially yeast, they can also drive cravings since yeast feeds in sh on sugar. And of course, that's what I experienced. Gut dysbiosis can also reduce the level of, of serotonin that we produce. In fact, about 70, not 75, 95% of the serotonin that we make is produced in the gut. And serotonin is important for stabilizing mood. So if it's low, it can result in cravings for sugar, carbs, or comfort foods that are going to trigger us to produce dopamine and serotonin. Also, an imbalance of, uh, of not an imbalance of, of habits, but if you have certain eating habits, like drinking too much water with meals, that can reduce stomach acid. And we need stomach acid for good digestion. So it's uh, important for us to drink lots of water, but it's best to just take small sips with our meals and try to drink the majority of our water between meals because when we drink too much, we dilute the stomach acid, which is crucial for good digestion. So if we don't have enough stomach acid, we may not be digesting and absorbing all of the nutrients that, we, that we're eating. We, we all hear the saying, you are what you eat, but in reality, we are what we eat, digest, and absorb. And if we're not properly absorbing the nutrients from the food we eat, then that could lead to deficiencies, which can also contribute to cravings. Uh, a very common example of that is that many people are deficient in magnesium, and when we're low in magnesium, that can contribute to cravings for chocolate. When it comes to improving our gut health, which is strategy number two, I think a personalized approach is best. In other words, a person's specific symptoms need to be considered in order to identify what changes may need to be made, changes in their diet, possible supplements, or uh, digestive enzymes that the person may need to take. However, there are some general recommendations that can help many people achieve a more balanced uh, gut microbiome. And uh, of course, we always hear about probiotics for this, right? But we also need to eat plenty of what are called prebiotic foods. And prebiotic foods are those that are very high in fiber because they feed the good bacteria in, in our gut. So some examples of prebiotic foods are legumes like beans, lentils, um, garlic, onion, leeks, asparagus, banana, whole grains like barley and oats, also apples, flaxseed, and there's others. Um, in terms of probiotic foods, those tend to be fermented fruits, uh, not fruits, foods, like sauerkraut, kimchi, kombucha tea, kefir, and lots of types of pickled vegetables. Of course, supplements is another option, but I tend to feel like it's best to get our prebiotics and probiotics from food. Well, prebiotic, it has to be from food. But there are times when supplements can help, and one of those times is, in particular is if you're taking antibiotics, because as I've already mentioned, they kill off good, both good and bad bacteria. So whenever somebody needs to take a course of antibiotics, then it's important to replace the good bacteria by taking a, prebi a probiotic. Excuse me. Root cause number three is unstable blood sugar, and this is one of the most common ones. As we already know, when we eat sugar, the pancreas releases insulin, which allows the glucose to get into our, to our cells for energy. When it's not in excess, or if it comes along with plenty of fiber, it'll look like what we see in the first graph. In other words, we'll, uh, glucose and insulin will increase, but then it'll slowly and gradually come down over a few hours. On the other hand, when we eat too much sugar, we have a spike in glucose and insulin that's followed fairly quickly by a lower dip. In fact, glucose dips so low that we feel hungry soon after and we crave more fast-acting carbs to give us another energy boost. 
over time, the longer we're in this cycle of eating sugar and refined carbs, um, it makes our insulin, our, our, sorry, our pancreas have to be producing more and more insulin we, so we can develop insulin resistance, which means basically that our pancreas is working overtime and our cells start to get tired of having to process it so much. This can become the vicious cycle that we see here. We eat too much sugar and refined carbs. Glucose goes up along with insulin production. We become not only insulin resistant, but also leptin resistant. Leptin is the satiety hormone that lets us know we're full. When less glucose gets into our cells, more of it stays in the blood so we feel tired and the excess is stored as fat. This results in frequent hunger and cravings for fast acting carbs, like I already mentioned, and so this cycle is perpetuated. So the solution is to stabilize blood sugar, of course, by limiting fast acting carbs like sweets and refined carbs. But it also helps to aim for healthy protein or healthy fat at every meal or the combination, both healthy protein and healthy fats. Healthy fats are things like fatty fish, especially wild salmon, avocado, eggs, nuts, seeds, olive oil, coconut oil, etc. And then, of course, getting plenty of fiber from vegetables, fruits, legumes, and whole grains can help as well because when we are uh, eating fiber along with sugar, then it slows down the, the process. Um, and so I also want to share with you some healthy swaps because, of course, what I'm focused on here is eating whole, real food. But when you do have cravings, let's look at some ways that you can satisfy that craving with whole, real food rather than sugary, processed food. So we can replace dessert with fruit. And how much and the type of fruit matters depending on your particular health status. Berries are the number one choice because berries are rich in antioxidants, they're very high in fiber, and they tend to be lower in sugar. In other words, they have a lower glycemic index. And then after that, summer fruits are also a good option. Um, things like watermelon, nectarines, peaches, um, cherries, that sort of thing. Winter fruits like citrus fruits, um, also uh, pears, apples are the next best option. And then the last two, tropical fruits and dried fruits, are the ones that you do want to limit a little bit more because they, are, um, they do have a higher glycemic index. So with tropical fruits, that would be things like pineapple, mango, bananas, and then, of course, dried fruits is what you definitely want to limit most because the water has been removed and in dehydrating them, it can be easy to eat a lot of them and they're very high in sugar. We can also replace candy with dark chocolate, especially dark chocolate that's at least 70% cacao. Uh, that would be a much better option than, than candy or any type of candy bar. Full fat, plain Greek yogurt with fruit and a bit of natural sweetener like honey or maple syrup or even 100% stevia is a good uh, substitute for ice cream. Stevia um, is one of the only sugar substitutes that I recommend, but it does have to be the type that's 100% pure. And if rather than sweet cravings, uh, salty or crunchy snacks is what you crave. Here's some good substitutes. Um, it's also important to note that jicama, which is not in the picture, but it's the last one that I mentioned in the list there, is a prebiotic food. But as far as satisfying that desire for something salty or crunchy, um, popcorn that you make at home is a good option. Nuts, of course, nuts are best. Uh, either dry roasted or raw, because when they're roasted, they tend to be roasted in unhealthy fats. 
um, veggies with hummus or even uh, making your own veggie chips. All of these are good options. If potatoes are what you tend to crave, uh, then sweet potatoes, purple potatoes, or yams are a healthier option because they're higher in fiber and other nutrients. If pasta is what you love, we have some great substitutes these days like spiralized veggies. There's lots of different veggies like zucchini, butternut squash that you can spiralize, or you can eat spaghetti squash. And then we have lots of great options, like I was saying these days, for whole grain pasta that's even gluten-free, um, like pasta made from brown rice or from quinoa. And then soba noodles is a great option because they're made from buckwheat, which is kind of a misnomer because buckwheat is not actually wheat, and so it's also gluten-free. So along with this webinar, I'm going to be sending you a, a bonus, which is my ebook called How to Break Up with Sugar Without Giving Up Sweetness. This ebook not only discusses how to break up with sugar, but also includes several healthy dessert recipes that are sweetened with dates rather than sugar. I love to make desserts that are sweetened with dates because they are um, actually very nutrient dense and they have a lot of magnesium. I was mentioning earlier that a lot of people are low in magnesium. The ebook also discusses the pros and cons of various sugar substitutes. So like I gave you a little preview to that, you know, where, when I mentioned that 100% pure stevia tends to be the only uh, sugar substitute that is actually safe and healthy. Well, actually not the only one, xylitol which is a sugar alcohol, is also. Um, but I talk about not just artificial sweeteners, but other options like honey and um, maple syrup, things like that, and talk about the pros and cons of each one of those as well as the artificial sweeteners. And so I will be sending out this ebook along with the recording to the webinar. So everybody will receive the recording. So if you want to watch it again, if there's something that you didn't quite, you know, catch, I know that I'm talking a little bit quickly, then you can definitely rewatch it. Root cause number four is a hormonal imbalance or, or various types of hormonal imbalances. While Insulin is also a hormone. There's other hormones that can play a role in cravings, uh, and that includes hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, and melatonin. Cortisol and adrenaline are stress hormones and melatonin is a sleep hormone. Some stress is actually normal and healthy. We tend to think of stress as all being bad, but it really isn't. We actually need some little bit of stress, a little bit of adrenaline and cortisol to help motivate us and to help us respond to challenges. In fact, an increase in cortisol is what helps us wake up each morning and get ready to face a new day. It gives us the energy to face a new day. When um, these hormones are balanced, cortisol decreases at night when it's time to go to sleep and melatonin rises. The problem is when we're chronically stressed, which puts these hormones out of whack. In fact, excess adrenaline and cortisol can cause cravings in and of itself, but they can also interfere with melatonin production, which can then lead to sleep issues. So um, not getting adequate sleep can be another factor with, for cravings because when we're sleep deprived, we don't produce enough ghrelin. In other words, um, we, I'm sorry, we produce too much ghrelin, which is the appetite hormone. So we, if, when we don't get enough sleep, that means we end up being hungrier. And when we're tired from not enough sleep and we're producing more ghrelin, we tend to crave fast acting carbs to give us a quick energy boost. So 
we can't always change the external factors that causes stress, but we can change how we respond to them. So a lot of it is about our own mindset, but we also can incorporate various practices into our daily routines or into our lives that promote relaxation, like everything that you see listed on the screen. And there's many more ways to manage stress. Perhaps you have your own way of managing, like maybe going for walks or something like that, or pets, for example. Pets are great for, <laughs> for helping us feel more relaxed. And I know that time can be a factor for people, especially that lack of time is often the reason we feel stressed. So it may seem or feel daunting to add a practice to our routine, like meditating every day or doing yoga or what have you. It is important to try to carve out that time, but there are things that don't necessarily have to take up a lot of time, like deep breathing. In fact, I love to recommend to my clients deep belly breathing because it tends to go a long way toward calming the nervous system. In fact, there is a particular technique that I like to recommend that is called the 478 breath. Dr. Andrew Weil recommends it quite a bit, so you can even just Google that or search it on YouTube, 478 breath, or, uh, and you'll see, I'm sure the first thing that will come up will be a video by Dr. Weil where he's demonstrating that technique. Basically what it involves is inhaling for a count of four as you fill the belly, uh, holding it for a count of seven and then exhaling for a count of eight as you contract the belly. And as you do all of that, you place the tip of your tongue on the roof of your mouth, but right, right where your palate ends and your teeth begin. And so that's a very calming um, way of breathing and it's, it even helps relax you before going to sleep. Last but certainly not least is root cause number five, emotional eating. And this can really be a webinar in and of itself as well. There's so much that I can say about this topic and it's actually what most of my clients struggle with, but unfortunately I'm only going to be able to cover it briefly today. You've probably noticed that imbalance has been a theme with many of the biochemical root causes that I talked about. It's also a factor when it comes to emotional eating. In other words, when we work too much or we don't have life balance for whatever other reasons, we tend to eat in order to fill a void. Stress, of course, can also play a big role, and it's extremely common for people to get cravings at the end of the, uh, the day when they finally sit down to relax, like um, Karen mentioned at the beginning. And I'm telling you, I hear this all the time from people, and I sometimes experience this myself. Um, and given what we've learned about sugar and carb cravings causing a dopamine or a serotonin release, it makes a lot of sense because indulging in your favorite snack feels like a reward or and it's literally a way that helps us relax um, but it's important to try to break that habit because the more we do that the more we remain addicted as as we talked about and um it's all some people also eat to stuff down their feelings or to avoid feeling whatever upsetting feelings they're struggling with. It's also very common for our childhood experiences to be a factor in emotional eating, and this can be both due to negative and positive experiences. For example, a lot of people were raised to clean their plates as kids, and so this actually conditions us to not listen to our own body's satiety cues as well as we could. Um, because we, you know, we may actually feel full, but we ignore that and feel the need. We feel compelled to finish everything that's on our plate because that's how we were trained. And that early programming can be hard to break. Um, and we may not even be conscious we're doing that because we're so disconnected from our bodily sensations or from our, our, our internal cues for uh, fullness or for satiety. And, you know, it, it can lead to overeating because people continue eating after they feel full. Also, cravings for very specific foods can be because of positive associations we have with food from childhood. So, it, 
For a lot of people, food equals love. It may uh, remind them of positive memories. For example, baking cookies with mom or going out to get ice cream with dad, things like that. So again, I, I wish that we had time to talk about this much more because this is a huge um, issue in and of itself. But I will just uh, share a strategy that I think can be helpful for people being able to overcome emotional eating. And I think it's really about mindfulness. And so I have kind of the ABCs here. And for those of you who've taken some of my other programs, I, I also have the ABCs of mindful eating, which are similar, but this is a little bit different. This is actually an earlier step in the sense that it's about helping us overcome emotional eating. So the first step is awareness and asking yourself, am I physically or am I emotionally hungry? And if you're not physically hungry, if it is emotional hunger, then asking yourself, what's the underlying emotional need or desire? What am I needing right now? Is it more emotional connection? Is it more relaxation? And then the second step is taking a moment to breathe, hit pause, and rather than just reaching for whatever you're craving, take three deep belly breaths. It can be using the technique I talked about earlier, or just three deep breaths, but making sure that you're breathing very deeply from the belly, contracting, um, uh, sorry, expanding the belly as you breathe in and contracting it as you breathe out, because this tends to calm our nervous system. And just doing this helps us take a step back and be more mindful of our thoughts, our feelings, our body, our actions, and then make a conscious choice to do one of the following. You have three options. Well, really, you have more than three, but the three that I would recommend is either distract yourself. Um, if it is emotional eating, do something else. Take a short walk, do a couple yoga poses, call a friend, especially if emotional connection is what you're really craving. If that doesn't work, then try a substitution. I shared a number of different swaps earlier that are things that you can reach for, that you can eat to try to satisfy that craving. So again, if you're craving something salty or crunchy, try some nuts instead of potato chips. If you're craving ice cream, do the, the yogurt that I talked about. If you're wanting candy, do some dark chocolate. If that still doesn't work for you, or maybe at times that works, and maybe at another time, you're so emotionally upset that that doesn't work. And so then you have the option of moderation. Go ahead and eat whatever you're craving, but eat a very small portion and really savor it. Take the time to chew it slowly, to smell it, to um, notice all of the flavors, the texture in your mouth, and most importantly, eat it without feeling guilty or ashamed. Because when we a lot, when we feel guilty, when we beat ourselves up, where we go into shame mode for eating something that we believe we shouldn't be eating, or that maybe doesn't serve us or help us reach our goals, when we feel guilty or ashamed, then that tends to perpetuate the stress and perpetuates the cycle of emotional eating. Okay, so those were the five root causes of cravings, the five strategies to try to overcome them, but I actually have a bonus strategy to offer you because I find that detoxing from sugar can really get great results because it helps to simply get the sugar, refined carbs, and processed foods out of our system. And when we're able to do that, it can help us take back control of our cravings. Um, it really does reset our taste buds. As I was saying earlier, it helps us appreciate the more subtle flavors of real whole foods, and it can help create that balance in our brain and our body um, to help us overcome the cravings. 
people who've taken my 10 day sugar detox have gotten great results. This is what a couple of them have had to say. Since doing the detox almost a year ago, I've lost 53 pounds. I have more energy and feel better. My taste buds changed. The portions of food I eat decreased and I feel satisfied. I've also no noticed my skin is fresher. And uh, Pat actually did the sugar detox over two years ago. And I'm happy to say that she's continued losing weight. At this point, I think she has lost about 60 pounds by continuing to mostly eat clean. The, the thing is that even when you do the sugar, for the sugar detox, the 10 days, it is pretty strict. There are a lot of things you aren't able to eat, but that doesn't mean that's forever. It's for 10 days. People can get through the 10 days. It's not always easy and how much you're already eating those type of foods will kind of play a role in how easy it is for you or how easy or how challenging it is. But beyond the 10 days, it's about eating clean, what I call 80-20. So in other words, eating real food 80% of the time and then 20% allowing yourself some indulgences or maybe even 10% depending on what your particular goals are. So for example, if you're diabetic or if you are um, trying to lose a significant amount of weight. And then Rebecca said, food is no longer driving my day. I'm enjoying the day without always thinking of my, the next bite of food. I have more energy. I lost weight and have more confidence in continue, continuing a healthier lifestyle. So you can see where cravings are reduced, where people lose weight, their skin becomes clearer and smoother. That's definitely something I noticed. My skin felt a lot softer after I gave up sugar. Less anxiety. There's somebody else who did the sugar detox who really struggled with anxiety on a frequent basis. And she said she didn't experience it at all during the 10 days. Once she, once it was over, she ate some chocolate and it, her anxiety immediately returned. It improves your digestion, again, more energy, and there's often other benefits as well. The way the 10 day sugar detox is structured is that there's a pre detox webinar that discusses how to detox, in other words, the, to, the 10 steps to follow during the 10 days. And throughout those 10 days, there's daily support via email and a private Facebook group. And then afterwards, there's a post-detox webinar where we talk about how to eat clean long-term, like I mentioned, either 80-20 or 90-10. I also offer a couple of bonuses. One of them is new. In the past, I've always offered the clean food recipe guide, which includes breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as well as some smoothies. And I just do want to, green smoothies in particular, I want to say a, a bit about that because eat, drinking green smoothies is something that really helped me when I broke up with sugar. I drink green smoothies most days of the week, probably probably, well, about three or four days a week. And that helps me get plenty of greens in my diet, which really are foundational to good health and to help curb our cravings and to reset our taste buds. So there's smoothie recipes, there's breakfast, lunch, and dinner recipes so that you have some ideas or suggestions of what you can eat during the 10-day detox. And I have to say that having that mindset, meaning focusing on the healthy and delicious foods that you can eat is important versus focusing on the things that you can't eat. And the new bonus that I'm going to include this time around is a free 30-minute EFT tapping session for those who actually post on the Facebook group each of the 10 days and watch the post detox webinar because in order to succeed i want people to succeed i want you to be able to have transformations in your health and to do that it's important to really participate to be engaged so participating on the facebook group is a sign that you are really engaged and i want to be able to reward that with offering a tapping session 
And for those of you who aren't familiar with emotional freedom techniques, it's a mind-body stress reduction modality that is very powerful. It combines modern psychology with the meridian system that's used in acupuncture and acupressure, where you literally tap with your fingertips on meridian endpoints on your head, face, and upper body. There's certain points as you are saying certain phrases that remind you of your stressors and, and eventually you shift into positive affirmations. So saying the things that stress you helps you release them. And then uh, the affirmations helps integrate the more positive thoughts and beliefs. So EFT is great for eliminating emotional blocks and limiting beliefs. It even works on pain. It works on many things. And I incorporate that into my coaching with clients. I also do tapping sessions individually and even have a group tapping program called Tap Into Food Freedom. But I'm offering this free 30-minute session for anybody who completes the detox by watching the post webinar and posting on the Facebook group. And the investment for the 10 Day Sugar Detox is $65. And uh, with that, let me go ahead and um, put myself back up on the screen and open up for questions. So um, if you can unmute yourself, I'd be happy to respond to any questions about anything whatsoever that I covered in the webinar today. What's your thought about agave as a sugar replacement? Great question. Thank you for asking that because I, when I showed the slide with the 73 different names for sugar, I meant to highlight agave because this always comes up and a lot of people think of agave as a really healthy substitute. Agave is one of the types of sugar. Yes, you know, we think of it as natural because it comes from the agave plant, right? But it's a type of sugar that is highest in fructose. And so you all heard what I had to say about fructose and how fructose in a lot of ways can be even worse than glucose because of the risk for fatty liver. So having said that, I'm not saying don't ever use it, but it's definitely not something that I would use on a frequent basis. Thank you again for, for asking that. You mentioned honey. Honey is okay to use? So yes, with a caveat. It depends on your goal. So it's not okay to use during the 10 day sugar detox because during the 10 day sugar detox, there's no type of sweetener or sugar that is allowed. <laughs> um, of course, once you're beyond the 10 day sugar detox and you're trying to eat clean, honey is okay. Cause like I mentioned it, you know, when I was talking about instead of ice cream, eat um, some plain Greek yogurt with maybe a little bit of honey or maple syrup. So in small amounts, yes, it is much better than refined sugar. It is more natural. It has a lot of healthy properties, especially local honey. That's local raw honey can even be good for allergies, for example. But again, not something you want to overdo if you're trying to reduce cravings or if you're trying to lose weight, but a little bit from time to time is okay. And is it the same for molasses? Maple syrup, yes. Molasses, molasses, yeah, because molasses has a pretty low glycemic index. I mean, it's a lower glycemic index than, than table sugar or refined sugar or lots of other types of sweeteners. Molasses, of course, has a very strong taste. So, you know, it pairs well with certain things, not necessarily with everything.
And thank you for, for asking about honey, because that's also a common question. What else? What else can I answer? I guess I just want to um, compliment you. I've uh, taken a similar webinar with you before, and I feel like this one was even more helpful. And then secondly, I wanted to share that when people ask me what did uh, the sugar detox do for you, I always say I'm not ready to give up sweets. However, if I make an exception, it better be totally delicious and worth it. I'm somebody <laughs> who would just always on the job. There are like these whatever Vaughn's Ralph's cookies and uh, I would just eat them out of boredom. And I still eat sugar, but now I try to, uh, I ask myself intentionally, is, is this really worth it? Will this be super yummy? And if the answer is yes, I will have it, but uh, try, trying to go with the 80-20 rule. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for those comments. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you that, and it, what you're doing is, eating mindfully it's making a conscious choice it's choosing the the best alternative or the best type of uh sugar or or some or not necessarily the best type of sugar but something that's really going to be satisfying and really savoring it and really appreciating it and i think we're able to appreciate those treats because again we can't be perfect and even i you know uh that eats very, very little sugar. Um, in fact, pretty much the only sugar I eat is a little piece of dark chocolate that's over 70% cacao. And I try to buy the like the ones that are more like 82 or something like that because it has very little sugar. And so I do eat that. And I, even though it's a small piece, I literally take several bites. I really like take the time to savor it when I'm at that moment where I like, I want to relax. Um, and I, I enjoy it without feeling guilty. And, and even though I do that on a regular basis, if you are, but that's, you know, it also has antioxidants. So it, it, it is a healthier option when you are though treating yourself with something that isn't necessarily a healthier version. Like let's say it's a piece of chocolate cake or some ice cream or something like that. Um, that I think it's important to do it less frequently, like, you know, maybe once every couple of weeks, because then it will really feel like a treat and you'll really appreciate it and savor it as opposed to when you're doing it on a more frequent basis, not to mention the fact that if you are doing it on a frequent basis, you're going to get back on that sugar roller coaster, <laughs> which we see on this slide and you know what, sorry, Karen, I know you can't see the slides. But there's a picture of what I call the sugar roller coaster and what goes up must come down. In other words, when we're causing those, um, those spikes in our glucose and, in, and insulin, you know, we go way up, but then what goes up must come down and we stay on that roller coaster, which creates more cravings and it's hard to get off. And that's really why I advocate for the 10 day sugar detox, because it's not a way that you're going to eat forever, but it helps you reset your taste buds. It helps you get off that roller coaster and so that you can hopefully continue to eat clean 80-10, 80-20 or 90-10. And any other questions? Nope. Okay. Well, before we wrap up, I do want to um, have you answer one last question. Now that you've uh, learned a lot more about cravings, what causes them, and some strategies, and I've shared more information about the detox, on a scale of zero to 10, how ready do you feel to detox from sugar? With zero being, uh-uh, no way. <laughs> And 10 being, yes, I'm there. So if you wouldn't mind unmuting your, your devices and just answering that one last question for me, and then we will wrap up. So who's I'm a 10. I'm excited and ready to go. Awesome. Thanks, Eve. 
Who's next? I'm at 10, 10 for 10 days, but hesitant <laughs> about yeah. the that, yes. 10 days. Exactly. That's all you have to do is the 10 days. Who else? I think we may have lost Irene. I don't see her name up on the screen. And I do see that Skywalker joined us. Skywalker, I'm not sure at uh, what point you joined and how much of the webinar you heard. Um, so it might be a little bit more. Hi. Yeah, I just, I just got up. So I just caught the end. I'll have to catch you on the replay. Okay. I just wanted to get some new pointers and updates though on um, sugar, so I've got to catch the beginning. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, um, so there's no one else on the line, right? Okay, so the other thing that I failed to mention when I was talking about the 10-day sugar detox is that I'm doing it a little bit differently this time around. In the past, I did it as a, actually when I first started doing them, it was in person, and then I've moved to online webinars just like this, where the participants have to be on live. And going forward, I'm actually going to provide two options. There's going to be the live option like we're doing now where you will be uh, on the webinar along with me so that we can interact. And, but it will also be available as a recording just the way this one is going to be. So the difference from before is that in the past, everybody was had to be on live, but I want to make it accessible for people to because in the past, people haven't always been available, and I don't want that to be a barrier. And so people who join it when I'm going to offer it live, my, my hope is that they'll all be going through the 10-day sugar detox at the same time, that it'll start uh, a certain day and end a certain day. But those who can't do it at that time, have the option of watching the webinar at their convenience and starting the sugar detox whenever it works well for them. And that can be either because they're not available during the webinars, but it could also be because maybe they have a vacation coming up and the 10 days that we have it scheduled for is, you know, they're, they don't want to be detoxing during a vacation, things like that. So I do want to make it more accessible to people in that way and I will be following up with all of you sending out the recording sending out the ebook that I talked about how to break up with sugar without giving up sweetness and I will be sending information uh, for you to enroll in the 10-day sugar detox if you're interested and that will include the two options meaning for you to do it the 10 days that will be scheduled, that will be scheduled versus doing it on your own whenever you're ready. Any questions about that before we wrap up? No? Okay, well, I wanna thank you again. I'm really grateful that you were able to join me live. I'm happy to have been able to share this information with you and I will hopefully See you soon and uh, look forward to continuing to support you in any way that I can. Have a wonderful weekend and bye-bye.